Hello, world, and welcome to episode nine of our behind the scenes podcast of the upcoming feature length documentary film, God Said Give Them Drum Machines The Story of Detroit Techno. I'm your boy, Reggie Dokes, and uh, I'm your host on this great podcast. Listen, this month we'll be sharing with our audience pastimes and future of the cultural movement of a Sharivari festival within the dance music scene. I love Sharivari festival because this festival really makes it a point to showcase its home grown talent. Also guys, you'll hear from Paul Leslie and Sterling Jones from the group, a number of names who created the 1981 hit Sharivari. One of the Sharivari Festival's creators, Todd Johnson, he'll be speaking with us, and his daughter, Carmen Johnson, aka DJ Silly Girl Carmen. So, for our music in this episode, you'll be hearing a mix of songs from a number of names and DJ Silly Girl Carmen's 2019 Sharivari Festival set. Guys, I don't know about you, but I'm excited about this one. Let's get into it. Uh, hi, this is David Grandison. Um, I'm one of the producers on the film God Said Give Him Drum Machines. And, you know, and I'm honored to, to be able to uh, speak to Paul Leslie and Sterling Jones of the group, a number of names. You know, we, you know, the, the God Said Give Him Drum Machines team was, was, was honored to be able to talk to them and to listen to their recollections about the story of the inception of one of the seminal tracks that dropped in 1981. And I was, I was actually honored to be at one of the first times it was ever played for the, the, the teens that it was created for. Um, you know, it, it, was, it was an homage to a scene, to a, a group of party clubs. Um, and the party club it was an homage to was the party club called Sharavari. So now we're gonna hear from Paul Leslie and Sterling Jones from the group, A Number of Names, about the movement that caused this track to erupt in Detroit and uh, a little bit about, you know, the inspiration and, and how this thing came to be. Heading for the highest heights, for the climax of the night. The people there, they just won't quit. Because the music's really it. Sorry, Rory. Sorry, Rory. Sorry, Rory. We're just some ordinary, you know, um, young young folks, you know, at the time, um, with um, with with ambition. So yeah, we had that ambition behind us, and uh, but you know, the um, what inspired us to make sure Rory was attending the clubs, listening to the top DJs at the time. And, and so, you know, you, you, you go to those, you would go to those gigs and, uh, totally different experience. you know, it was just, it was just new. It was wow. just, it was different. As an example, I would, you know, when I first started um, clubbing, you know, I guess what, 16 years old or so, tried, maybe tried at 15, you know, but, Maybe couldn't get out the house all you know <laughs> every time, <laughs> but you know back then you know uh, uh, I, I would go to you know parties, neighborhood parties, backyard parties, you know in the neighborhood, in the neighborhood, and um, hey, it's all great, you know. You go from uh, yeah, Rick James, uh, and then they put on you know uh, Parliament Funkadelic. And then maybe some Donna Summers that come on next. So all that was great. That was great. But when you went to the clubs, mm -hmm. it was a different experience. Because not only did you hear that, 
And that's one thing that that that's um that stands out with me was the music was always diverse. You know, and you know, it came into electronic, you know, um, music you um, hear thing. That. Right. Normally. Right. But um, uh, but there, you know, at the at the um at, at the um gigs there, you know, where you're you're listening to the latest electronic music, well, Prince and Gap Band and Rick Gap James, all that stuff, that was all included Cameo. too. Yeah. You know, all that was included. But the thing, but the thing is, um, at these clubs, now you're getting, I'm listening, I'm hearing music that um that wouldn't you wouldn't hear get on the radio. You know, I couldn't hear you wouldn't get this on GPI, you wouldn't get um Trans Europe Telex, Express, Trans Telex. Europe Express, yeah. you wouldn't get things that. like that. And maybe Mojo. Yeah, maybe <laughs> Mojo <laughs> might, you know, right. You know, Trans Europe that. Express. But these guys had a whole different, um, they brought a whole different sound um, of music, an international sound. Uh, sometimes That's we refer we to it as uh, Italo disco. Right. You know, you got Telex, yeah. like he mentioned, uh, Kraft, well, Kraftwerk, first yeah. time hearing Kraftwerk. You know, Daryl probably was Daryl Shannon. Oh, it was. Yeah. Probably was up there spinning. Yeah. You know, sure and the first was. time hearing some electronic music, Kraftwerk, yeah. Trans Europe Telex. Express, and you know, Telex, uh, the music is booming. Right, the music is booming. You know, I can hardly. I'm standing. I'm right next to you, but I can't even hear what you're saying. You know, right. shouting or whatever. Fog is in the air. And, it's you know, that kind of, ball. it couldn't <laughs> help but just have an impression on you, you know, it was just, uh, it was just yeah, it was kind of left amazing. a very a good, a big impression. Yeah, you know, I, I think that what you're talking about really is, 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 a, is a vibe that was very unique to Detroit in that our scene was inclusive. Um, you know, it, it, many people don't know this, but Detroit was a test market for the entire nation for radio. So okay. on the radio, okay. we heard Every new artist that came about, and and you know Jeff Mills told me that in an interview. Okay, with him. Detroit would be one of the first market. test markets. We were the ones who heard the most diverse music okay. in the country in, on the radio. Okay. But then we had local DJs who were going to the you know the the, the shops that were around back in the day. You know, Buy Right and uh, you oh, know right. all, all of those shops, and they were absorbing all of the imports that were coming in because wow. we wanted to hear the newness. We like you said, a wow. Tato disco. We wanted to hear, wanted to hear you know Raichi Sakamoto and Yellow oh, Magic okay. Orchestra. You know, Yellow we Magic. wanted to hear, yeah, yeah. and we oh, we soaked it all in. And right. and so I think one of the things that you all were able to do was you embodied that as a local group and exactly. we loved it you you know you embodied the voice yeah. of the movement that yeah. we were pushing forward in the par local party clubs the, the yeah. teen groups you know you embodied it you made the anthem <laughs> and so you know i, I gotta <laughs> say like when i heard that i couldn't believe that that it came from our circle and so that to me is really the inception of what became detroit techno so you know hats off you know, to you for doing that. But but my Thank question you. is, did you hear, what was it like for you when you heard your song being played in these places that we were dancing? Well, I, after a record was pressed up, I've heard it here and there. Um, uh, we, we actually um, had taken it down to WGPR, to Mojo, and Mojo had played it over the air. And uh -huh. that was just a test cop. Right. Record's not even printed right. up, but that was yeah. just a you know. In fact, yes. fact, the test copy was first played at a backyard Charvari party. Mm -hmm. I had one of the Charvari guys pick me up. We took. It's just a test copy. We played in the backyard. And everybody went nuts. Mm -hmm. But I, 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 you know, um, but like you said, the first time hearing it, actually, on the floor on the at a party, right. uh, I would have to say Leomo. Leomo's, oh, um, I know you guys remember that was on Six yeah. Mile. Of course. <laughs> yeah. No, it's uh, and, uh, East Seven Mile. Yeah. Oh, it's, I think it's, uh, is it Seven? Six. Well, Luomo, yeah. you know, Club Luomo. Luomo. 
Yeah. yeah. Everybody yeah. knows that. Exactly. Yeah. Absolutely. Like they yeah. were like, they were like, we're gonna put your record on. And so this is like my first time hearing it at a club. You know, you, know you got the speakers, you know, you've got the boom, you yeah. know, the full boom, you know. The dance floor is completely full. The dance floor is, you know, and you know, really I was I was had I was even surprised at you know the um sound and the uh, that it gave that the sound that it gave at a club. You know, I, that was my first time hearing it at the club. And I was, I have to say, I was impressed myself. <laughs> I was impressed myself. What really impressed me was the crowd itself. There were so many people there, uh, a lot of them from the scene and other other clubs and places. And they were so, it got to go. As soon as the song started playing, they started going, go, 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 the entire song. <laughs> so that was like one of our first experiences at um, getting a reaction from a crowd uh, for Sharavari. You know, your, your song embodies the, the, what we were emulating. You know, you, 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 you talk, one, one, first of all, you talk about, you know, Lumo Vogue, you, you, know, you talk about, you know, all, you okay. know, driving in a Porsche, you know, driving, you know, you talk about very much the, the, you, you, that song embodies what the scene was all about because we were really emulating, like you said, the, uh, the Tallow Disco, the Giorgio Romero, the cars. American Gigolo, all okay. these films that, that the we designer all looked at. That, that was a part of the right. scene at the time. Right. That was a part, yeah, that was a part of the scene at the time. Like people inspired to, yeah. you know. So here, here's my question for you that I think is really pivotal. This Was the song based on the party club, Sharavari? And were, how were you guys affiliated with the group of guys? Was it a tribute to, or was it a part of, you know, what the club was about? I'll be honest with you, uh, we were actually rivals in the party clubs. We had our own party club, so we were rivals. But they were just a little better than us, you know. They with you know most of the time. So we just I said, uh, you know, we said, uh, why don't we make a song and we'll unify it by naming it after that party club. Yeah, and that's what we did. Yeah, and, you know, and that shows the unity though, because you know, again, I, I think that a lot of times the the scene among party clubs. Was okay. We're we're not always going. Yeah, you know, we're not always battling each other. We're we're trying to one up each other in the quality of what we're doing. Right. We exactly. were battling. We right. were saying no. you're we're, the best. Right. It was a good rivalry. Right. 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 Yeah. It was, right. right. Friendly it rivalry. Was friendly wasn't rivalry. it? Yeah. Business friendly rivalry. competition. Right. You know. Be, uh, you know. We among found the, a way to connect among the DJs. Right. Among yeah. The DJs and, the and the party, the party um, promoters, promoters. You know. And these were um, different types of parties. But they were party clubs. Right. So they were, you know, okay, elite so from, from uh, you know, your average club party or lounge party. Sure. Yeah, and, and so it is more to it than just that. You know, right. it's not just the uh, the club thing. There was right. also it's the designer store of Charavari. Yeah, and then right. and then actually we created a character there who was called Charavari. Right. Right. Yeah, but uh, I believe there was a New York clothing store called Charavari, right. uh, spelled with the S. With a C. Oh, spelled with the C, and we spelled ours with an S. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And then, as you see, the uh, other uh, remakes come down the line. You see, they change the swelling up too. Mm -hmm. I mean, the spelling up too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, they put the eyes in instead of the E and yes. such, and divide the word. <laughs> but uh -huh. it, you know, it's all the same. Yeah. I, I love, you know, I love what you're saying because for me, it definitely, you know, I was at those parties. I went, I went to Lumo. Okay, I, right. I was. I was very much an observer of the scene. I was a little young. I was like you. I was sneaking in at 15, okay. you know, and I was I was I was up in there trying to you know, you know, you know make sure that I was seeing everything. But I I looked up to you know what you all were doing and again, for me it resonated and clicked that this was something bigger than just a group of teens throwing a party. When you okay. did that, and you changed the game because right. marketing was a huge part of what the party clubs were doing. They had a flyer. Many times they had, like you said, they had a logo. Oh. Enterprising young people. They were some of the cleverest yes, flyers ever. <clears throat> yeah. Some of the flyers were clever. I wish yeah. I could get a hold of a lot of them. They're classic. 
I, I've got I've got a collection and don't don't make me go grab really? it and start showing you guys oh, yeah. old flyers oh, wow. because I've got a oh, huge wow. archive and collection and uh, that's something that resonates with me is wow. you know and that's something that I think that we're really trying to as a part of this project carry through in our education teaching young people that that, wow. that entrepreneurship started okay. in Detroit. That's At the right. time that these parties, not I've started, but was a part of what these party clubs exactly. were doing and what they represented. It's exactly. showing that people, uh, young folks could start entrepreneurship at a young age. You know, mm -hmm. all these people were young. They were, you know, aspiring. They're throwing these parties. They're making a lot of money, you know. And, and they, like you said, we changed the game. And a lot of them, we, they did, made we took great, it to the record. And, yeah, they made great careers out of it also. Yeah, they made great careers. I, I, you know, got a, um, you know, um, my hat goes off to um, the DJs um, who, you know, began or, or helped give it notoriety. Get, who helped give it notoriety and take it to another level. BPR and right. television. Yeah. yeah. But, you know, with these young, um, these young artists, these young DJs, the way they were able to take it out of Detroit to Europe, all Japan, all over the world. I think that was, that was that's phenomenal. phenomenal. Yeah. Who were some of the DJs I, I, you know, that, that you recall on the scene? You know that that, that you all were were contemporaries to, and who you all looked up to. Yeah, looked up to those guys. Mm -hmm. So you would get a, a different music, music that you would normally hear. You know, um, and then you know, you know, you had disco for you know before you had disco. Wow. So a lot of it had the you know, electronic sounds in it too, you know, but, right. But I was thinking, I'm like, well, you know, okay, you had Studio 54. Well, you know what? I think you had to be at least 18 <laughs> to get in that. So we had our own Studio 54, <laughs> you know? Right. So, um, and, and, um, and, and it was not just the music, but the art form that they created as far as, Mixing music uh, that is a was was just great. That's that that that's what we're really, you know, attending these parties. I mean, the way they would knew how to blend the music together, um, cut it and and um, extend it, uh, take out certain parts, uh, you know, things like that. You know, that, that were you know though that was different. That was I, you know, I think that the things that you're describing are, are so important because, you know, our film is definitely really trying to capture the, the essence of that emergence of blending because, you know, Ken Collier was, you know, one of the first oh, yeah. guys that anybody can remember blending in Detroit, you know, one of the first, right. Right. Um, right. you know, and, and so we, we want to give tributes to, to him, you know, to he and the, and, you know, and, 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 and heaven and, and, and these early spaces. But, you know, we also, what you said was we had our own Studio 54 as kids. We, we'd be up in Barth Hall or we'd be up in the YMCA. The YMCA. And putting a thousand okay. people. That, that was great, too. YWCA. Yeah. I mean, let me correct that. Y -W -W -C. Y -W -C. Y -W -C. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Down there on Woodward. Yeah. 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 And exactly. Park Avenue. Yeah, and yeah uh, Park Avenue. Avenue. Which I think was yeah. great, too, how, you know, the parties. Um, would be thrown at different venues instead of it being the same place. You know, everybody comes to the same place. Yeah. Oh, it'd be, oh, you it's might, like, one weekend, you might be downtown, you might be out in Southfield, oh, you know, the yeah. next weekend. Sometimes it was a because, rooster tail. Yes. Yeah. Because the time you right. look out on the back while everybody's yeah. dancing, you see frozen ice right. on the river. Because, you know, we yeah, follow the disco we and techno. The, right. You know, we follow the promoters and the DJs. So wherever they were going, they say this, that's where we're going. So, you know, uh, the, the, the crowd followed them. Yeah, yeah. We, we had Daryl Shannon. We had Steve Dunbar. You know, we had, you know, oh, wow. all of the local DJs, you know, who, who really set the, the tone for the scene wow. and were the tastemakers. You know, it, it was so important, you know, to us because these these tastemakers were really what, what laid down, what proto- techno was you know and and right. again these were the 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 basis and again I, we you know what you said in terms of talo disco is something that a lot of people don't necessarily call out but we did emulate it a lot in yeah, our music okay. and embrace kano you know we embrace okay. uh right. you know john roca 
you know, oh, and, and okay. we, you know, we held them like they were from our circle, but you all right. made it real and a yeah. part of okay. our circle. Yeah. And so that's like, good. that's the key to, See, to your, okay. your legacy is you told us we could do it. And uh -huh. it, okay. the, the, the guys like Juan, you know, and, right. and, you know, yeah. <laughs> deep space and, and direct drive. Exactly. Embrace the right try. Right okay, that's yes, right. Indeed. Yes. You were telling me before about Daryl Shannon and how you looked up to him. Can you tell me no, more about no. that? Yeah, Daryl Shannon was Daryl Shannon. That was my hero on the on the dance floor. And that he was really like the uh, the top DJ, you know, of the time. Everybody knew if Daryl Shannon, wherever Daryl. Wherever Daryl Shannon was spinning, that's the where part. everybody was was gonna go. That's the part. Uh, trying to describe his style. Wow, you, could do you so know different music, and then he had classic mixes. Right, right. Daryl Shannon had classic mix, classic mixes. One of the most classic mix where, mixes between uh, Kano and Gino. So right, Shannon. you know where he would have one that, and I would expect to hear it again. When I went, you know, the the following weekend or weekend after, and he had certain classic mixes where he could do like Kano, and that was mixed with Gino, Gino Dancer. Socio Dancer, to where it almost sounds like one song, <laughs> you know, the way he's mixing it, but but the two they just uh, went well. together and mixed so well, and. Uh, Wow, you know, very classic mix. Yeah, very yeah. popular on the dance floor, and even to this day, just listening. Oh, yeah, it's really one of the greatest mixes. Well, ever you ever. know, I, I think your point is valid that we listen to these DJs because they were artists in themselves. In that, whoever the created themselves. the mix that blew your head off that night, okay. everybody was talking about you for the next week <laughs> because right, you okay. blended. I, you know, I, exactly. I, I didn't know you about it. Right? Yeah, I didn't know you could do this. With this song and that song, right. you know, together, that like I just yeah, I did it so masterfully. Yeah, you know, sometimes blending it, you could cut if you wanted, but most of the time you blend it. You never knew that the song changed. You might yeah, you know, be yeah. that clever. Mm -hmm. and, yeah, you know, and, that, uh, that's yeah. really what the scene, you know, what was about because we wanted to hear something new. We didn't want to hear it exactly the way it was played on the radio. That yeah, was the purpose of the DJ. That's right. That's you know, right. he played it differently. You know, That's and again, right. when we heard your track, they would repeat your track and rock right, that right, out for okay. 10, 15 minutes, you <laughs> right, know, and, exactly. and we were getting exactly. it in. Yeah. You know, I remember at the YWCA, a party, when they played your track, you know, they had the big track that was up high around, okay. around the top. I thought that was going to fall down. Damn, <laughs> wow. it was, the ground was bouncing okay. so hard yeah, yeah. and vibrating so hard. I thought yeah. we were about to break the wooden floor on that <laughs> old oh, okay. basketball. Yeah. Floor. That wooden floor. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and that was that was the how we embraced you know what 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 you did. And again, you know what you did was slightly different than Alleys of Your Mind, which came out I think the same year. Because it was club music, it was it was the vibe that we were really dancing hard to, to, to and, you know, and so that's the the to me just such the, like uh, you said, the gift you gave kind of made a theme the theme song right. of it, right. yeah, yeah, of the era, exactly. yeah. yeah, you know, I, I will say that, timing, yeah, for both of us, yeah. yeah, oh yeah, timing is everything. Yeah. It was just perfect timing. Yeah. You know, you know, maybe if it's going to catch on or not. Right. But maybe if we would have made are. it three years ago or three years after, you know, timing is everything. But, you know, the music and the timing was just perfect. Right. You know, and I think that goes with a lot of great artists, right. you know, of the timing and the artists. They have to be in sync. Right. And it was just the right time for it. Yeah. So were you all were you all musicians or DJs? Tell me about your musical background. Yeah, okay. We were a little yeah. above. Yeah, yeah. I well, played guitar and keyboard, and then we were DJs yeah. as well. Um, and Sterl played drums. Actually, you know, actually we we dabbled in into um, DJing. You know, I as far as DJing, I would say like um, I might be able to I can might be able to play a little keyboards. You know, this and, but I'm not a keyboardist. You know, I can play a little piano, but I'm not a pianist. So as far as DJing. You know, it's something we dabbled in, 
And also um, at that time, you know, we were um, uh, promoting parties too. So we're just not just DJing. We want to throw a party. Let's rent a hall. We're going to hire these DJs, you know. Right. But um, as far as Sharavari being made, um, yeah, everybody was, um, we were musicians. And actually, um, the way we um, uh, put together the song to be recorded was, you know, as a band. You know, Number of Names was a band. Right. We're not just DJs, you know. Um, even with, you know, with Sharavari, you know, there's a bass. There's Everything is live. There's live bass, Everyone. Yeah. you know, live guitar. Yeah. You know, live right. vocals. Like um, right, exactly. Even, you know, live drums. Live drums. So, you know, guitar, right. Everybody playing. So a number of names, a number of names um, uh, was actually a band. More so than DJs. That was something that was before a number of names. Yeah. <laughs> and so, you know, um, even when um, I'm not, not sure if you guys are familiar with Schizo. Um, that that came out after Sharavari, but you know we were still as a full band, you know. So when we came to perform, we would come to perform as a band, you know, not to spin records, you know, per se. We were coming to you know, as a band, and then you know, um, but but you know, the spinning the records, the DJing that that caught on, you know, that caught on. We're still. Uh, we're still producing electronic music, but you know, we're a band, you know, more so than, you know, more so than, more so than DJs. Right? I, I think that's, that's the beauty of where, what Detroit offered was, you know, we, we all believed in, you know, the, the sound obviously that came from Motown. We've all believed in instruments that were being used to create instrumental dance tracks and we love and embraced that sound that came from instruments that were playing this music Very and true. i think that that's something that's unique about detroit while we embrace synthesizers and drum and machines why, oh yeah we also yeah. wanted to hear that fullness of an entire group yeah. were there were there any sense that you used at all on on um, on, on Sharavari? yes it oh, was yeah. yes it was yeah. we used uh, synthesizers you know but played them like keyboards the only difference right. was they had effects, right. but they were still right. played like keyboards. Right, mm -hmm. okay. Mm -hmm. Right, yeah. And that goes but, for a schizo and everything else we produce, you know, there's mm -hmm. all kinds of keyboards. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What you're saying is, is so, I, I think, very, very much emblematic of that sound that, that, that came from disco. You know, disco was playing with a full orchestra. Vince Montoya, these all okay. these disco yeah, orchestrators right. that, that, that <laughs> came before you it was embodied in detroit and we were able to then take it and because of synthesizers it allowed us to have a smaller group of people who were doing it and you didn't have to have you know the the same orchestra orchestrated <laughs> right. 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 right yeah that beginning that was just a, that was just a great time it was a great time to be young um a young detroiter you know at the time with the clubs and the djs I kind of find it um, interesting that, you know, they were pretty much from the same side of town. They were, you know, it was like, you know, really the schools, the high schools that were involved were, I can probably, Henry Ford, Cast Tech, Renaissance, uh, Mumford, Oak Park, Southfield, you know, as far as, man, you know, the main, you know, uh, that's where the main crowd was coming from. So, you know, it was like, and, and these guys knew each other. You know, they were really they were kind of from the same, you know, side of town. They grew up together. Yes, yeah. they grew up together. And uh, and that's generally, uh, yeah, some, you know, outside of the area that, you know, uh, were a big part of it too. But generally, you know, it's uh, just something about how, you know, it's a certain area, side of town of their area where, you know, these artists came from, mm -hmm. um, which is, you know, even like with Motown. Well, that's how it was with Motown. A lot of the Motown artists, they, these guys came from the same side of town. Uh, Marvin Gaye, Stevie Wonder. See, these guys, a lot of these guys, they knew each other. They grew up together. 
Smokey Robinson, you know, knew uh, Stevie Wonder. These guys stayed right down the street from each other. You know, uh, uh, kind of, you know, reminds me of Motown as far as, you know, it's just a group of people, you know, young folks who, you know, and the, love the music and get into the music and make something happen of it. Yes. So who, who all was in the, um, your group in a number of names? Okay. Well, basically, uh, it's Sterling and I, but we would incorporate other folks. Like uh, we had Roger Simpson and a, and a few other folks. Uh, Rob Taylor, you know, worked with us initially, like on Charavari and Schizo, helped us uh, do things like uh, arrangement, things like that. And basically, it's me and Sterling, and we sometimes switch up depending on the project. Then in Schizo, uh, we enlisted the help of a couple of young ladies, uh, Barbie Sasso and uh, Mary Lukowski, you know, and they were our female vocalists in that. And now we're doing uh, some other uh, current projects with another, you know, a group of folks. But uh, at the root of it all, Sterling and I. Yeah, because, you know, Paul came to me one day. I don't know. It was, uh, uh, no, that was before 81. But he can he's like, you know, we've been clubbing, whatever. And I said, you know, hey, you uh, ever thought about you, you might want to make a record? I was like, make a record? It's like, he's like, yeah, you know, we could make a record, put the, you know, this and that. And, you know, before then, we had some kind of background in music. You know, I played drums. I was a drummer. Um, uh. I mean, it, it was it was uh, it was just me and my cousins, but you know we had a band, and, and Paul he's played guitar for as long as I can remember, you know. So he came to me with this idea, let's make a record, and I was like, make a record, like yeah. So um, I, I put the right. So we just figured out from there, you know. For the most part, I did the lyrics, and for the most part, Paul did the music. But, you know, then we had to incorporate it, incorporate, you know, other artists. You know, we needed a bass player. We needed a drummer, you know, like that. Um, so a number of names originally was Paul. And it was Paul and I. Robert Taylor. Roger, Robert, Rod, um, Robert Roderick Taylor. Simpson. Robert Simpson. He was the bass player. And then we had two um, female vocalists. And that was Ira Cash and Sheila Wheaton. Okay, and so that was the number of names. Wow. That was the band right there. Um, and at that time, now, at this time, it wasn't as easy to get your music out there. I mean, now you could just sit at your computer and pretty much make the song and put the song out right wow. there. But, you know, it wasn't that easy that time. But um, we hit the pavement. And you know, radio, radio we approach radio yeah. stations like Mojo, this yeah. and that. And we did the financing. We printed our own records up, so we had our own records printed up. Um, and uh, as far as promoting them, you know, we promoted them, you know, through going to different uh, radio stations. Yeah. And you know, we were lucky we yeah. would get some play, you know, from them. A pressing plant, yeah, that's, uh, Archer, yeah. and that's where we were getting our records printed up at. Okay, well, when everybody else started getting into it, you know, other groups, uh, he had um, Cybertron. Cybertron, he had whatever, you know. At that time, the wax was, you know, the twelve inches were dying out. Fading. But, 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 but um, Detroit Electronic Music did a lot. To, to put that record pressing plant, you know, back on the map. Oh, they they made, you uh, know, uh, kind of failing. Right, at that the, time. Uh, electronic revolution. Exactly. And then, you know, once we came and everybody was getting their own records pressed yeah. up, you know, there, and that kind of brought Archer Records, you know, uh, back on top. Mm -hmm. Just a little, you know, something about, yeah. about that, yeah. Do, do you remember where you recorded? Uh, I'm, uh, I'm curious. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Studios was on Six Mile and uh, Six Mile and no. Southfield. 
It was six mile right past Southfield. Um, you guys, yeah, somebody might be to remember six mile past Southfield. There was a recording studio, and I think it was a donut shop, a popular donut shop on the other side of the uh, same side of the street, but on, on the um, other side. But <laughs> yeah, but um, you know, the studio's not even there anymore. You yeah. know, but um, we have some great engineers. Yeah, we had a couple of great engineers. But you know, that was in the time where it was still recording studios in Detroit. Right. We haven't had an no, engineer who had right. and he had built his own computer. And that's where the electronic voice in Charlotte comes from. It's a one of a kind uh, self built computer by the mm -hmm. engineer that was at mm -hmm. Tanner Studios. Right. You know, it's so important what you just said because that's something that we're also trying to speak to is the fact that the first Detroit techno artists were computer programmers. OK, the first yes. engineers you worked with were computer programmers and they were adept at what they did because they yeah. were creating new sounds, new, you know, new ways of making music. Mm -hmm. And that's something that, you know, that's a legacy that we have to pass on to to, right. to young people and let them know in Detroit. We were the first ones who were doing that. And then yeah. it, moved, it, it moved on to the Mike Huckabees who became sound designers yeah. and are, you know, were selling sound. But it started right. back when you were there and what, yeah. what you did. Exactly. So it's really yeah. important what you just said. Yeah, yeah, yeah I agree with you. Uh, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. That's it all. Yeah. That was yeah. the, yeah. the start yeah. of it, yes. Um, yeah, I, you know, I, um, I really appreciate what the other artists have done, though. Um, to bring the, the genre up, yeah, uh, to, to uh, keep the excitement going, and uh, uh, everybody around the world is loving it, you know, right? So yeah, they, they, yeah, they so I really way. commend, though, uh, I can really commend, you know, um, uh, those guys, you know, yeah. mm -hmm. you know, what one thing that I also wanted to ask you about who who specifically did the voice. For and, and and spoke the the lyrics. Okay, yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> that's a good question for Sharvar. Yes, um, it starts with uh, uh, the uh, intro. With the intro, you know, it starts with me. Let's have a little more. Energy. All right, hold that pose. Great, great. A little to the left. A little more. A little more. Good, good. But then when you get into that foreign kind of guy, got that kind of accent, whatever. Well, that's Paul. Some bread and cheese and fine white wine. Design and cheese about the matter of time. Yes, and that's Paul there. Now when you get to the chorus, we have uh, Robert Taylor. Very good point. That was because, because what does he do? The he does the shower. Bari. Shower. Bari. Shower. Bari. Shower. Bari. Body. He did the main vocals, and hey. Robert Taylor did the chorus. They did that. Um, that um, ad lib, Sharavari. That was Robert Taylor. Yes. Uh, and the rest of us back yeah. it up, uh, Sterling and I, yeah. and Sheila and Ira, mm -hmm. helping with the chorus. Right. Trying to, uh, um, you know, and trying to capture that masculine, you know, kind of suave, kind of, you know, kind of sound that was, you know, uh, that was, you know, and at the time, you know, and uh, yeah. Uh, well, it sounds like you guys can still do it because I heard you guys do it on the phone earlier. Well, I, around, but, I think yeah. you guys can still do it. Oh, he sure could. Paul <laughs> can still do that. Yeah, oh, we still do everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. You'll do a little bit for us. Uh, <laughs> you put me on the spot. Sure. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Judy, Judy, Judy. Hold that pole. Okay, great, great. Right, good, a little to the left, a little more, a little more. Little a little more. Little good, more, little keep, more. It keep it going, keep it going. That's, that's it, right. that's it. That's it, that's it. Bread, cheese, and fine French wine. Banner sheets are but a matter of time. Would this be the real thing? Or is this just another thing? <laughs> I could have gone on to see if I could. Oh, that was good, though. That was so yeah, good. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Awesome. yes. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> yes. 
it, you know, again, it, it's such a it's such a legacy. You know, you you know, we we you know what you what you've done and what you laid down was you know was, was so important. And I you know again, yeah, I just I just have to pull my hat off to you and um, you know just say you were a formative part of my imprinting as a young it's adult. Right. You know, and you showed me that it could be done locally and yeah, that it could be yeah. done as well as they're doing it anywhere else you yeah, know so, that's, so that's, that's so important great. that's great Absolutely. okay wow well, can you can I you tell me the first time you heard it on the radio what was that like uh, can you describe that and who uh, you, you remember who was the first person to play it uh, uh, that would have been, that would have been um the electrified mojo um wgpr yeah. um, um, the yeah, WGPR. WGPR. WGPR is Mojo. Yeah. Uh, Might have been during the Midnight Funk Association uh, or something like yeah. that. Yeah. We brought it um we brought it in. We went um this uh, down Jefferson. It was a summer night. And uh, I think we pretty much had the whole group with us. Yeah, we like we just gonna knock on the door or whatever, you know. Hey, he he, he received us. Hey exactly. guys, come on in. Yeah, what uh, what y'all got here? You know, so we're kicking it with Mojo. You know, the great is my first time meeting him. You know, so he puts it on. Yeah, like let me see here what you guys got. So he puts it on. And he's 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 not playing it over the radio. He's just listening to it in the studio. What was a cassette tape? Cassette tape. The vocals weren't even up. Oh yeah. Okay. Right. And so we said, okay, he was like, yeah, this, you guys might have something. He's like, you know what? I'm going to play this tonight. Whatever. I say, so when y'all leave, you know, y'all leave out, you know, Didn't get in your you car. Say, you guys made this? <laughs> right. He looked at his yeah. ride. I don't think he, the sound of it and looking at us, I don't think he connected <laughs> to, the, the two. He was like, you guys make this, you know. Uh, yeah. So, um, so yeah, he said, um, you know, uh, I'm going to play it later on. So, you know, so when we left the studio, you know, it's in the evening and uh, got our radio on, you know, tuned in to the Midnight Funk Association, you know, blow your horn, flash your lights. Flash, turn yeah, your and on. yeah. And, uh, and wow, you know, sure enough, Mojo played that, played it for us. Yeah, he played it that night. And yeah, that was uh, wow. wow. You know, like a, wow. it's like a dream come true. Right. It was a dream that came true. Like, wow, I'm hearing this, you know, after all these months and whatever, and now I'm actually right. hearing it on the radio, you know. And uh, yeah, it was like a dream come true. Yeah. That was 81. <laughs> yeah, that was it. Yeah, that was um, 81, summer of 81. Yeah. And so, you know, a lot of people don't know that, you know, uh, Mojo actually can give you guys some, you know, a little uh, trivia here. But, you know, but uh, yeah, Mojo actually gave us the name, a number of names. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, I don't know if you guys ever. Yeah. 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 Studio. He was with uh, a, a Free Press. I think it was Free Press or Detroit News writer Jim McFarlane. They were sitting yeah. out discussing. Yeah. Jim McFarlane, in. he wrote the entertainment um, yeah. column for the, uh, I think it was the Free Press. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. They were listening to us and they had a little discussion. And they were, what is their name? We weren't even. So they were they were asked at the time when we brought uh, Sharvari in to GPR for Mojo to listen to, we did not have a name for the group. There was no name established at the time. He, Mojo says, well, you know, what are you guys' name? We're like, well, you know, we're still working on it. We got to toss the football around. <laughs> so we're like, you know, we're, we're still working on it. He's like, okay, whatever. And um, when we came back to him, next time we saw him, he said, I have a name. He, was like, he said he was talking to Jim McFarland. And Jim McFarland said, well, what do you think is a good name for him? And Mojo said, no, Jim McFarland said, a number of names comes to mind. And Mojo said, a number of names. And then the next time we saw Mojo, he said, how you guys like this for a name? A number of names. 
and yeah, we and, and we chose it, yeah. and that was that stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Wow, that, that legendary, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, it, historic moment. Thank you, you know, for sharing that with us. Because again, Mojo, we we all have to give homage, you know, to Mojo. Don't we? The uh, taste really, baby. I like to take this time right now to give homage to him. Oh, yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yeah, Mojo was a very important part. You know, uh, boy, Mojo was an exceptional DJ. Yeah, I, I think that your, you know, your 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 point is so it resonates so much, and you know, he he his sound reverberates around the world to this day. His oh, name yes. reverberates around the world, and that he gave you your name is is you know is such an honor, you know, and and you know just allowing you to tell that story because you know again people have to you have to be open to hearing creativity and hearing creative, uh, you know, hearing creative yeah. thoughts. And, and how things just come about sometimes, you know, sometimes ideas and things come about accidentally, you know, sometimes it just drops in your lap. Uh, mm -hmm. So you said something about, are, did, did I hear correctly, you guys are working on some other music? Uh, yes, yes. Actually, um, you know, off and on, you know, we've never really stopped working on music. You know, just, you know, we'll get thrown back, you know, here and there. But, you know, usually after we regroup, you know, we'll be back in the studio working on something. Yes. Uh, see, last thing we uh, were working on, uh, we was working with uh, guys, a DJ here in Detroit, uh, Wynn, DJ Wynn. Yes. And um, so we we had been uh, this has been uh, this is like uh, it's been about a year ago when we were in the studio last in the studio we put a, put together a few tracks um, so um, you know we're working out trying to iron out the details on all of that but uh, but yeah we've we've got some new music we kind of always have had new music some music you know here and there but as far as uh, waiting for the right opportunity, and you know, to release it and this and that, and you know, that's where the problem comes in. Uh, um, D. Win, yeah, that's what I said. D. Win, we're, we're working with, with him. Kelly Salam, yeah, Kerry Salam. Um, yeah. uh, several tunes with, with those guys. Yeah, yeah, and another production. Right. And actually, one is out now on SoundCloud. Yeah, one you can pick up on SoundCloud. Right now, yeah, it's called electronic music. Yeah, it's called electronic music. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, that's just one of. I think we put together um, seven. All together was like seven, and then um, we did remix of Charvarian Sketch. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah, you know, we're, we're we're actually you know still working on things, and then you know. And, um, you know, if things work out, you know, for hopefully, you know, we'll have something, something out soon, something new out. Yes. Yeah, we're, we're looking forward to it and we are going to support it with all the energy you know, we okay. have uh, you know, as part of you know, what, what we're doing, you know, at, you know, God said, give them drum machines, because, you know, again, we have to really, you know, acknowledge and support, you know, the creators of the art form. And yes. you know we you you know we appreciate you wow, know, what man. you're doing. So we we we'll we'll help in any way we can. And uh, you know we, we that, that means so here. much to me yeah. to hear you say that. Yeah, yeah I appreciate that. Yeah. I really yeah. do. You know, I I was excited That's... that you mentioned D. Win. You know, one one of the creators of, of the Music Institute. You know, okay. uh, legendary DJ. You know, the fact that you all are working with him. It speaks to okay. being a pure, pure genius, if, you know, doing doing what you do. Were you involved with like going to any of any of his things back in the day, like at the Music Institute or any of these other legendary uh, no, spaces? And, and actually, it might be too. Yeah, I actually wasn't familiar with that at the time. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, but no, I wasn't. Yeah, I, I haven't. Um, um, D. Win. Um, we just met through Kelly Salam. Yeah. You know, a couple years back. And yeah, exactly. Well, you know, it, it's a small world in Detroit, but yet a big world in yes. Detroit because wow. there's so many artists in the D 
you can be so out. long and not and not need right. all of the artists that are connected to the Detroit. Right, right, exactly. That's why right. really exactly. blown up. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, and uh, I'm looking forward to this Sharavari uh, the four day party. I'll put it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm looking forward to that. That's yeah, gonna be something. yeah. But they they're doing great things with that too. Uh, really, because yeah. mm -hmm. they they they've really grown, and you know, in the past eight years, I think this will be their eighth eighth anniversary for the the party. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we have to give you know much love to Ty, you know, and 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 yeah. his team, you know, for for really being able to to keep that alive. And it's so it's so important that it's coming back now after this huge uh, de, you know, COVID challenge that, that, that right. it's okay. faced. Yeah. So you know, we gotta support. You know, we gotta support the Shara Bird yeah. you know, Music Festival. Yeah, I like to know that I, I do. I appreciate them and I support them. Yeah. You know, um, absolutely. absolutely. Yes, I just hope a lot of um, young folks, you know, if they um, uh, need to experience, you know, at least experience this electronic music thing, you know, a lot of them may not be familiar with it, but boy, I don't see how after you leave one of these parties, how you can't be a fan, right. <laughs> you know, I mean, yeah. Yeah, yeah that's, that's the whole that's reason that Sharvari as a festival is so important because it's exposing you know people to the origins of the sound and then have creating a stage for all the latest and newest artists that are emerging but while paying you know uh, homage to the legacy that you you yeah, left. Yeah. it's like um not always recognized you know like it should be but um electronic techno music has come a long way and it's really is here and I think it's here to stay, oh, but it's, uh, it's very, it's popular yep, in, in different forms. Yeah. And I um, think it's big yeah. enough to be like that. You see maybe a, a couple of folks go to the Grammys. That's about it. Okay. But you see intrinsically, it's warped into the fabric of society now, commercials, right. uh, that's, uh, movies, yeah, you can't right. really get away from it. Right. Kind of like rap. But, you know, we, we've got to give the due you know, to the cultural origins, you know, and, and you know, again, that's that definitely, you know, uh, one of the, the visions and that's, you know, what, you know, what, what we're doing in, in uh, creating like Detroit Techno 101, oh teaching young yeah. people about the origins of the art exactly. form and the cultural exactly. institutions exactly. that created the art form, as well as the cultural movements that yeah. created yeah. the art form. Yeah, so that's so right. That's a big piece of what we're doing uh, as a part of okay. the Okay, movement. okay. Uh, all the things that you know that you've done, we're really trying to make sure that we are documenting that legacy in you know as accurate and as um, much detail as we can. So okay, hey, great, great. So you know, Detroit uh, party clubs. You know, as we've talked about throughout this podcast, we're, um, you know, we're, we're groups of kids who are art entrepreneurs and promoters. Um, and, and as we know, tracks like Sharavari allowed them and legitimized them and helped them feel that, you know, this movement was, again, much bigger than, than the clubs themselves. You know, there were DJs like, uh, you know, uh, Steve Dunbar, you know, and, um, you know, and Daryl Shannon. And, and of course, uh, the Direct Drive uh, crew and the Deep Space crew made up of all the seminal names that, 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 you, that you know, but uh, a number of names is very much, you know, a lost, a, a lost group uh, among those names. And so they're not, every, everybody doesn't know this story. So we, as a part of making this film, we have to tell this story so that our, our so that young people understand the legacy and, and, and know the history, but we, we have to give love to Shara Fari, the party club that has carried on this tradition of uh and this movement uh you know of uh detroit techno you know the charavari festival has uh gone on um you know for the past eight years and this charavari festival is very much embodying and uh and one of the only things keeping alive the legacy of detroit party clubs uh this festival is 
made up of local talent. This festival, you know, was, was started by, uh, you know, Detroiters, obviously the, uh, you know, Todd Johnson, um, you know, was it was the key and, and the, the pinnacle of this group. But uh, Steve Dunbar was there. Teresa Hill was there. Hassan Narula uh, and Grant Gray were all a part of the inception of this idea, um, you know, that, that became a, uh, a festival that, you know, that, that that's a little bit different than the movement festival and a, um, a, 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 a movement in itself. Because again, it's paying homage to to local talent and providing a platform for local talent. You know, this year this festival is going to be happening you know, on August twelfth um, through August fifteenth, um, and it's going to be in a location that is that is different. It, it's moved around to a couple locations in the city, but this year it's going to uh, be happening at the historic Fort Wayne, which in itself has a huge amount of history and that it's a, a, a literal fort in Detroit, uh, you know, and it, it goes back to the, to the 17, 1800s. And so they're going to use this historic location to, uh, to, to showcase Detroit talent and, uh, you know, give a, a show that, that's going to be unparalleled, you know, because this is a, 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 um, a revival of it. Last year, it, it was relegated to uh, you know, to a, um, a a streaming festival this year, it's going to be live. So uh, the energy is going to be insane, and the lineup is just as insane. So uh, you know we're you know we're looking forward to it. We we, we uh, if we can't be there in person, we'll have reps that are there. But uh, you know, so you gotta support the the Sharavari Festival and uh, and make sure that you know you. Uh, you you're, you make sure that if you can if you can make the pilgrimage you know to to Detroit uh, Techno's Mecca that you make that pilgrimage both for movement and for the Sharavari Festival because they're both uh, you know events that, that just can't be missed. You know, Todd Johnson and uh, the Sharavari Festival have been vital to the creation of the film God Said Give Them Drum Machines. Um, you know, Todd has uh, you know, graciously shared with us both a video archive and an archive of pictures and flyers, um, you know, that, you know that, that are primary source documents that are things that become a part of really capturing the, the, the scene and the lifeblood of what was happening during the time period of uh, the inception of, of techno. So you know, we're, we're grateful to, the plat to him for the platform that he created and uh, you know this platform allowed us opportunities to both capture the DJs and producers that created this art form in action, but also the opportunities to interview and speak to these uh, people in more in more detail. So you know I, we can't speak highly enough, and you know about the 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 the, um, the blessings he's given us in in allowing us to uh, be a part and to share in the legacy of the Sharavari Festival. In the 80s, you know, a brother does remember the clubs, Bratz, Shabatino, uh, 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 Snobs, uh, uh, and, 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 and Sharivari. So, I, it's safe to say, does the, did the inspiration come from that back the, in the day in the 80s? The, the inspiration of the style of festival that we wanted to have definitely came from the whole group's um, love of their upbringing in the 80s mm -hmm. as far as coming into the party scene. Not that, you know, we were little kids in it, like we were born in the right. 80s, it's just right. where we all kind of caught the fever was in the late 70s and early 80s. As you remember, and many others from the Detroit area remember, we wanted to have an event that kind of gave you that diverse, but yet involved kind of scene where people 
you know, the DJ and the people that were throwing the promoters and the people that attended the parties were all kind of like one big old family. You know, we kind of went from party to party and group to group. And, you know, we, we kind of wanted to bring that into now. So, yeah, right. it was highly, highly influenced by all of the what you would call the, the high school social club scene of the early 1980s, late 70s in Detroit. Right. Right. And, and just reflecting on that time. As a DJ, I just remember, you know, they they were gods to me. Uh, Ray Berry, uh, oh, yeah. Ray Berry uh, was man. <laughs> uh, you know, Steve Dunbar. You know, I, I, man, I remember those cats. They would walk around, bro, and and they had. I remember they had jackets. They were like Letterman <laughs> jackets, right? With di- with direct drive, you know, stitched on the back and their name on the front. And I was just like, man, those guys are. Well, that God's was, <laughs> well, think about it. You know, it, it's still it's still like that when you look at the iconic nature of logos, even like the Shirevari logo or anybody's logo. Hmm. Logos and branding was not a name we were even familiar with back in the 80s. That was like a new thing. We just thought we were trying to create a family. I mean, it, you know, probably things we had probably seen in uh, fr- uh, fraternities and sororities or motorcycle gangs or something. Wearing your colors or having your badge, you know, that's, right. boy, that's Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, that's, uh, right. you know, uh, <laughs> the safety, uh, safety patrol. You know, there's always some type of emblem that means you're involved in something and you want other people to know. And then that, that, kind of signals other people that they want to belong to for whatever reason. Right. And, you know, some of the biggest names in electronic music and house out of Detroit is whether it be techno or house all came from that early stages. And now, now I want to say up front, I'm not taking credit for all that. I was just one of many that was doing things. But when you think of the names, whether it be Juan Atkins or Eddie folks or Derek May, uh, Delano Smith, Daryl Shannon, uh, yourself, Ray, Ray Bone, Ray Berry, uh, you know, everybody, whether they know it or not, that comes out of Detroit was influenced by that era uh, of the Dale Willis's and the Ken Collier's and uh, everybody, mm-hmm. Alton Miller, you know, D. Wynn, right. Blake Baxter. If you right. trace it all the way back to the beginning of who heard who and who heard who and who that person heard, mm-hmm. you're going to end up somewhere in the late 70s, early 80s all at right. some party that we've all attended, some some club, whether it be the Park Avenue Club or the YMCA or the Shintiki, the same high schools, Cast Tech, Mumford, Henry Ford, mm-hmm. you know, the whole sound of Detroit, whether it be house or techno, whatever you, you want to call it, progressive disco, it all came from that era. Right. And, and some right. people claim it, some people don't, because they want to feel like they were born. I created myself. Right. right. You know, and I just started playing. Right. I'm now the greatest. You know, but I think we don't always look back and give credit to all of those early promoters and early DJs and early venues that made it all possible. You know. Mm-hmm. The very birth of techno and house out of Detroit came from that. That's my belief. Right. Everybody's right. not going to agree with that, but right. the way I trace it, I can trace it back to individuals and say, well, I know you heard this guy, so you were influenced. Whether mm-hmm. you, you, know, you came to that party, you right. know, Eddie, Eddie folks came to a Sharvari party and he heard Daryl Shannon spin. Right. And, and he decided he wanted to spin too, you know. You know, right. the Jeff Mills, the wizard, used to listen to uh, Daryl Shannon and Delano Smith, and he says it. Mm-hmm. You know, Derek May says there would be no techno without Delano Smith. Mm-hmm. You know, so here are some guys that have then inspired more people after them that are looking back and giving credit where credit is due, and that's I, I think we miss that in this business sometimes. Right, right. You know, I, I just, you know, I, I just think people need to realize how special we are. You know, when you go to other places. They definitely make you feel special being from Detroit. And, uh, you know, I I think more of us need to, you know, hold up the bloodstained banner, if you will, for the city of Detroit. You know, and that's so true (laughs) because some of the Detroiters have forgot what we actually mean in this culture. It's culture. You're right. And and culture has to be preserved. Culture has to be educated. You know, we're getting this 
kind of just, uh, I hate to use the word whitewash because people think it's a racial thing. And, I, and that's not what I mean. But there's there's like a whitewashing of the history. Mm-hmm. Because I, I find in new generations, some people don't want to have ownership to anything that came before them. They want to say all this greatness that's happening now is because of me. Mm-hmm. You know, and they don't want to acknowledge influences or forefathers or four foremothers, however you want to say, you know, and I just think that's a mistake. I mean, history needs to be taught and history needs to be continued and respected. And, you know, you can still do your thing. Mm-hmm. You can still adapt and evolve. And your thing is still great, even though it came sprung from something else. Right. Right. You, you know, you know uh, since the pandemic, I know a lot of festivals um, were hurt by uh, this particular situation. How did you guys manage to to pivot when uh, COVID uh, shut down a lot of these electronic music festivals? You know, the thing the thing that we decided to do immediately is you're always seeking to evolve of the with the hand that you're dealt. You know, it's that old adage about if somebody serves you lemonade, you make lemonade. You know, and I think people, no one knew where COVID was going, but people were still saying, oh, we'll be back in 2021. And that was pie in the sky. You didn't know that. Right. You know, people were dying. People, you know, this disease, it took over everything. So, you know, we're still hopeful that, oh, a vaccine or whatever was going to happen and it's going to blow over in 2021. So we just kind of made a, a, a basically educated guess that, Sitting out from 2019 to 2021, two years of a brand being dormant was too much for us. Mm. We're not we're not a huge brand like uh, the Beat Ports of the world or the Lollapaloozas. We're a, we're a local brand, so we decided to start researching into how we can do you know have just our little festival. So mm. in 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 kind of uh, learning about how the streaming works and building the uh, computer platform to do what we do, we kind of discovered. Wait a second. We don't have to be limited to the three days and to the amount of time that the festival will take place. Why can't we do 24 hours and stream as long as we want? So unfortunately, the good parts of that also brought into the parts that you had a learning curve of thinking, wait a second, we're not videographers, <laughs> we're not right. filmmakers, and all of a sudden, you know, we have to run around and film all the DJs. We have to have some DJs turn in incredible sets like yourself. You know, oh, you, you. you filmed yourself and, and we were able to cobble together uh, basically 15 days times mm-hmm. eight DJs. So we streamed 120 DJs over a 15 day period, flipped the eight hours and let every DJ play three times a day to pick up a 24 hour time zone that then it could be viewed worldwide because people are thinking, oh, just your Detroit band are going to watch this. But in how we... We, we sought off the DJs. We weren't limited by continents anymore. Everybody mm-hmm. was home. Mm-hmm. So the, so it's the world was flat, you know, so anybody you called answered the phone. Right. <laughs> you know, everybody's right. home and right. they wanted to be seen. So with that, it was a huge, you know, it was just a huge win for us to be able to broadcast the thing for 15 days straight, 24 yes. hours and pick up fans from all over the world. That first stream we reached about uh, 67,000 people. Mm-hmm. And that was shocking to us. So it, it seemed like a fluke at first. So we came right back with what we called the Sweet 16, which was in October, mm-hmm. uh, based on Swedish Day. So we said, okay, we did 15 days just as a joke. We said, let's do 16 days. Mm-hmm. And so we got all new DJs. And then all of a sudden, we did the same thing. That stream brought in 255,000 people. And Incredible. then it's like, wow, okay, what mm-hmm. do we have here? And then streaming, mm-hmm. I think, has now become, it just becomes the regular norm. We, mm-hmm. we, struck, we, we did a stream almost every, every major holiday. We sought after DJs all over the world that we never probably could have even afforded to fly here or, or, or be in their country. And right. in our, in our pretty much exclusive agreement with Mixcloud, we really were able to tap into Mixcloud's huge audience as well. At that time, they were, you know, they were saying they had a, a 2 million subscribers. 
Mm. So you not only got whatever your social media footprint and outreach of the DJs and, and the Shower of Our Detroit proper, we were getting the mix cloud and some of the media sponsors that we were able to come on board. Like we've always had a great relationship uh, with Five Magazine out of Chicago. Mm -hmm. uh, we got Ransom Note from London was doing some outreach for us. Uh, Fusicology out of mm -hmm. California. So yes. with that new outreach, you obviously we're not this Detroit based festival anymore. All of a sudden it's the internet. Anybody that could tune in and watch this for free was tuning in. So now we have picked up fans from all over the world and, and DJ relationships from all over the world. And in the end that has helped us, you know, our, our theme throughout 2020 was driven, you know, that we're going to be just, we're going to keep you know driving regardless. And then we came up for 2021. The whole theme is the future. Mm -hmm. Like welcome to the future that this streaming thing, as far as we are concerned, is not going away. Right. So even with a physical festival being planned now, we will still have a hybrid situation where we are going to do the physical and go back to the Internet and stream at the same time. Not only okay. are we going to stream the physical content, we're going to film other DJs that are going to have content that's being created all over the world at the same time. So you can tune into okay. Charvari Detroit and you can continue to watch Sharvari worldwide and you can tune in. Uh, you know, I didn't add that during this learning this platform, we also launched a 24 hour radio station. Uh, Sharvari radio has 24 different branded uh, radio shows from all, you know, crews from all over the world, as well as playing the tunes from the festival. So for example, the Reggie Dokes mix that you've done has played probably 60 more times since you did it a year ago, nice. you know, because it's floating through a cycle through uh, the radio show, which is going 24 hours a day, grabbing the files mm. from the festival. And nice. so your picture and your mix, people from all over the world have heard that and not nice. saying that you aren't already a popular DJ, but I don't care if you get one more fan, 10 more fans that are now exposed to the Reggie Dope sign, you've just gained a fan that could possibly buy one of your, you know, your productions or Absolutely. support one of your appearances. And that's how it's supposed to work. This is supposed to be all just helping each other mm. expand brand, expand brand, expand brand, you know, and, and that's what we're trying to do. You know how tough it is uh, coming up just to get 10 people to your party, you know, uh, in Detroit, you know what I mean? <laughs> so, so, Detroit so, is like a, uh, uh, What's that yeah. movie out of Australia with Mel Gibson? Uh, 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 Mad uh, Max. Detroit, Mad Max, right. Detroit is like end of the world and there's no more water. And, right. <laughs> you know, we're, that's how you're fighting for crowd and fighting right. for uh, right. relevance and right. whatever. And not literally fighting, but, you know, to create a brand in Detroit and to sustain it is mm -hmm. no joke. And that's yeah. why. If you if you take the relevance and the uh, the history of DJs like Delano Smith, mm -hmm. I mean this dude has been at it for decades, you know, yes. and it's still relevant, you know. Mm -hmm. Al Al Esther, mm -hmm. you know Terrence Parker. I mean, you mm -hmm. know the names as well as I do. These guys are, are slowing are, are are showing no sign of slowing down, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and and mm -hmm. that is part of why. The individual has an age or a, or a due date or however you want to say it, but music mm -hmm. has no shelf life. You know, right. it should be we are trying to create more people to come into this culture and listen to this music. So it shouldn't matter which DJ is on. You know, it should just mm -hmm. matter if the tunes are hot. And right. Obviously, right. that's something you're trying to do is create hot tunes. <laughs> Hey, man, I tell you, it, it was it, it was such a pleasure to be a part of uh, uh, that experience. You know, I think maybe I've had at the most maybe a couple thousand, but to have, you know, 20, 30,000 eyes on you, DJ, yes. you know, that that was that was truly, truly a, a tremendous um, experience, you know. And, you know, I'm glad you mentioned um Delano and, and Al, because, you know, there are so many brothers like them that I consider to be our, you know, our unsung heroes, I guess the, the word would be, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, Al Esther used to do 
our parties in college and you know uh you know obviously delano you know was on the scene way before a lot of other cats you know dj hell he came in under the tutelage of you know one of the greatest djs ken coyer you know i I've, I've just always felt like detroit has some of the best djs in the world you know i i, I second that and i don't know if it, we're just biased but i think right the history and the, the work product mm-hmm. and the relevance, it's, it, it supports itself. And I think that's what I like about the project, like that you're involved with and everything that Christian is doing uh, with the films. And, you know, it shows it, you know, it needs to be written about. It needs to be filmed. And I think people that don't always realize all of the, the, the connect the dot type of things where it comes back to, why you like what you like and where this guy came from and what this guy was inspired. You almost have to diagram that thing for people and say, Hey, listen, this, this is the history. And that's how they do it in jazz and rock and roll and right. country. You can go all the way back to the fifties and forties and stuff with, mm-hmm. you know, with, mm-hmm. with something like jazz, you can take all the rock and roll. They're still talking about the sixties and the Beatles and all that kind of stuff. For some reason, electronic music, and the party scene and party culture and stuff like that, we don't show the same reverence to our past. We are always seem like we're kind of running from the past that every, we act like every five years it resets and all those DJs and all those promoters don't matter. Right. And, and, and now it's all about me. Well, you know, mm-hmm. I, I just think we need to start treating our own culture like it is culture right. and not some flash in a pan. Here we are for the moment. You know, you know and that's how we can get some longevity out of it. Right. Speaking of festivals, what what do you think, Todd, makes Sharivari a unique festival in comparison to you know some of the others that might be out there? Some some of the Sharivari system is or plan is is kind of like a everyman festival. Hmm. We we don't have anything such as main stages. All the stages are the same size. All the stages are on the ground. There's no stage, period. So I hate to even use the term stage because Mm -hmm. we use nothing but small platforms because we want the DJs to be eye level with the crowd. Mm -hmm. So, and all of the sound and lighting is duplicated on all three of the stages because we don't want anything to have any type of hierarchy like these are the main DJs. That's why they have the killer sound and the lighting and the lasers. But these stages over here, mm. they're just the regular DJs. So mm. we've always tried to do a mix and match. We don't do things like on the flyers. You're never going to see uh, difference in font sizes where, you know, Reggie Doak is in a 14 point type, but right. Todd is in a 10 point type, which which designates that obviously you're the star, right? Right. You're the headliner. We we pretty much run everybody the same font size, mm. same alphabetical order. So it's no why is Reggie at the top of the list and I'm at the bottom. We don't want to do any of that. Mm. And we and even as setting the times and the schedule, we try to make it. And I'm not going to say headliners because that's not a word we'd like to use. But we try to take veterans and mix in emerging and mix in newcomers all in the same vein in the same stages. Mm -hmm. So you might have a guy that's been spending one year is followed by a guy that's been spending for 40 years that then followed by a guy that just started last week. Mm -hmm. And then here comes another guy that's, you know, that's put out 20 albums. You know, we want it to be that the time you come to the festival, the day you come to the festival, that this is just everybody. We always, we always say words like fam and community Mm-hmm. and all this stuff we mean that mm-hmm. however we have to do it you know this is this is one of the we've only charged for three years out of the festival this is going to be a, a charge year unfortunately because coming out of COVID okay. many of the years of the festival the reason why we've been able to survive is that the incredible DJ talent we have have also been incredible in their effort of support and sometimes have played for free mm-hmm. there, would, there would be no shower bar without the DJs and the community support. So that is why we've been able to do it free. Wow. Now, it, this year coming out of COVID, we're trying to do a nominal charge. It's going to be $60 as the early bird for all three days. Okay. You know, there's over 60, 70 DJs. But 
that is still way cheaper than almost any festival that you're going to have with the same type of caliber of the DJ mm-hmm. that we have. And, you know, but they will get paid this time. And I'm sure they're happy, which are they? Because it's no longer, hey, man, do me right, a right. <laughs> <laughs> You know, some DJs hate when it's festival time. They get a call from me because they already know me. Hey, can right. you, uh, can you <laughs> donate an hour? It's right. just an hour. You know, right. surely you got an hour. You know, nobody wants to work for drinks. Nobody mm-hmm. wants to work for props. Right. I mean, right. after COVID, everybody's fine. No, I'm not going to say everybody, but most people's finances and scheduling was devastating. Right. So right. we would have been out of our gore thinking we could start calling DJs. Hey, man, ready for another free one? Right. Like, right, right. You've got to be kidding. <laughs> right, <laughs> you know, I haven't right. been traveling. I haven't been doing anything. You, you got to pay. So we have the added expenses of increased insurance. Okay. And increased fees, uh, government fees, and I and I don't want to belabor all that. We're we're charging this year because we need to charge this year. You know, you hear people say things like, uh, "I thought it was free," or "It used to be free." Well, yeah, it did used to be free. Right. You know, right. and and I'm not saying it's not going to be free again. That's always been our intention is to present a free festival, but we mm-hmm. have to deal with the uh, the situation and the in the involvement of everything around you at the same time. What was the inspiration behind you all saying, you know what, let's do an actual festival? Was it uh, conditions that seemed to be getting better in, in the city or? We, we always were already in the plan of doing virtual again. Okay. And, and then different things. We were always kind of like watching what was going on with where COVID was taking everybody. And then they started opening it up kind of like, um, with uh, 25% capacity and 50% capacity with, you know, restaurants and clubs and stuff like that. So we've just been watching it. Mm -hmm. So we decided we were going to do the hybrid situation where we were going to do virtual and we were going to do a smaller version of the festival. Okay. Where obviously we would be, you know, the, the city of Detroit had many different situations around your vending as far as like where you're going to have your food trucks and how people are going to eat. The, the tables had to be six feet apart and, and you were, you were doing contact tracing, all that kind of thing. We were going to try at a smaller level. And, you know, I would love to say that we, we were like these genius futurists of knowing what was going to happen, but we just got lucky that everything opened at the time we were already in the planning stage. Wow. So it just became a thing of, immediately trying to see who was available at the dates that we were given to give a festival. Cause you know, the same thing opening for us, that means it was opening for all of you as a DJ collective and boom, there was schedules to be made up. There was, there was makeup dates at clubs. There was, you know, you guys are ready to get out there too. I mean, some of you, you know, so there was bookings to be done. So it's not like every phone call yielded us a yes, I'm available. I mean, people are out already, right. you know, and, and as cities started opening up, like with Chicago or Atlanta or New York or something, you're, you're trying to wiggle and find dates that you could assemble the cast that you thought was respectable and, and you know, blended and diverse. You know, I, I don't, you know, this time we kind of came out the gate not doing, even though the highest concentration of Detroit based DJs, we were trying, obviously we reached out to you. And uh, uh, factors are created that we'll do that another time. But, mm-hmm. you know, you being from Atlanta, you know, we got, we got Glenn Underground, uh, CZ Boogie out of Chicago, uh, Sabine Blazin out of New York. We mm-hmm. got uh, Mary Droppins out of California. Nice. We obviously are trying to bring in a sprinkle of the world as we saw it from the streaming. Right. You know, that it's not just going to be a Detroit-based thing anymore. We're going to start sprinkling on the the extended fam <laughs> okay <laughs> it's right. not just the detroit fam anymore now it's the extended fam and then we have a plans to pretty much start doing promotions in other cities right with some of the alliances that we created during the streaming mm-hmm. there's opportunities where it's like if you have if you have people like like yourself and uh uh, Ash, uh, Ash Lauren and Kai Elsie and mm-hmm. uh, Laura Endorf was all in the same city. Mm-hmm. Why fly all of you guys for a party to Detroit when we could come down to Atlanta and throw a party down there, feature you guys there, mm-hmm. and, and maybe bring a couple of Detroit DJs there? So that is the right. that is the template of how we'll move through 
uh, late 2021 and 2021 is to take the circus on the road. <laughs> nice. Shall we say. Nice. And, and, and expand the reach, you know. Right. That's awesome. So this year, uh, the festival is in a new location. Did I get that right? Yes, we are in a location. If you're familiar from the area, uh, we're in Fort Wayne, Detroit, Mm. which is an actual historic fort built back in the 1840s down in southwest Detroit, pretty much near Mexican town. If you're still familiar with the area. Right. uh, Just a little bit west of the Ambassador Bridge. Right. It is an actual we will actually have the festival inside the walls of the fort, which is wow. going to make a very unique and historical per- perspective. There's a lot of history in the site itself, but then it, it's such a it's such an iconic thing of containing the sound and the people and how you come in to be in the actual fort and uh, the situation of having the being able to use the old barracks and mm. you know even even the it's a very iconic look to come in with the actual brick arch with the two cannons on top. You know, it's, got, it's nice. very interesting, right. totally okay. open. And I think people are going to be really surprised about the wow. uniqueness of it. And if we, one of the promotions that we did, we said that, you know, we're not coming here to battle, mm-hmm. but we are definitely <laughs> assembling an army on the field. You know, okay. Okay. Nice. You know what I'm saying that these <laughs> DJs is our musical army. For entertainment, and I think it's going to be, I think this is probably going to be the best one yet. And I don't want to sound like American Idol because they say every year the new crop of uh, you know talent is the best one yet. But right. we really do believe this one is the best one yet, and we've been able to uh, uh, really put together a great, diverse crew of people. And uh, I just look forward to it. I, I hope, I hope the the attendees look forward to it as well. Nice. So what uh, other goals, if any, do you have for uh, the festival, Sharivari? Can can Uh, you share that with us? The the main goals that we have is to constantly keep breaking any new DJ that's in the area that needs to be mentored Mm -hmm. by other people like yourself and to be able to play with their peers and to be able to be presented in a crowd that's ready to receive it. Every year we try to uh, really kind of showcase somebody different. So it doesn't look like it's always, oh, nothing but the veterans are ever going to get a chance to play. Hmm. We we broke new DJs into this on that level every year. And we we have a stage that we call Wonderful that is the all-female stage. So there was a lot of... Didn't you all do a a separate... Uh, streaming situation for the female DJs? Yeah, we did. We did one uh, during Mother's Day that was all women. And we did another one that was called Wonderful that was all women. And and it's not like we always want to isolate the women. The women are are put in with the males too, but we just wanted to have a stage because it just seemed like it was time to a stage that could be nothing but the accent of look at all this talent. You know, It's, it's always been there. It's just been lopsided as far as the percentage of how people get booked and stuff. You know, it's like, and that's how it is too. That's not always a gender-based thing. Sometimes it is, like I said, a veteran and a newcomer. If if, if somebody's only going to book what you call the brand name DJs, how will somebody that's up and coming ever get a chance to be on that level? Somebody has to make the conscious decision just to say, I don't care. I'm saving this many slots for not, and I don't use the word unknown, like that's some negative, but just emerging. Right. Somebody that needs a little extra attention. Right. Somebody that hasn't made it to, you know, to the level of somebody else that came before them. Mm-hmm. And that's that's one of our main goals. So our, our ultimate goal is, like I say, is to take the show on the road. And back to what you were originally saying about this being history and being culture and stuff. Okay. We want to spread that word around. And I think every time we throw a function or throw an event, we are spreading that that uh, that mission. Okay. You know, okay. here we are, and this is where it came from because we speak about the origins of it all the time, and whether it be in interviews or what we do, or we even try to showcase DJs. Because just like you have an emerging DJ, you have DJs that nobody plays anymore because they think they're too old or they think they're not relevant anymore. I don't know who decides these things. But we don't want to have any of those uh, those measurements. We, we pick all the DJs by committee. And our committee also contains other DJs. And, of course, 
you know, people always ask me how we pick a DJ. Why does this guy always play? Well, of course, we're human. So people pick their friends. They pick the people they grew up listening to. But then there's still slots that are argued about all the time. You know, no, I want this guy. I want this guy. And then it just becomes a, a vote of how, you know, hands up. How many people say Reggie Dokes? Or how many guys says, you know, Joe Blow? Right. And Reggie Dokes won right. win this year. <laughs> you know? Right. Right. And, and that doesn't sound like the most uh, foolproof method of throwing the festival. <laughs> but so far, you know, it's a balance of business and fun. I mean, most okay. of us do this for fun, you know. So, you know, here we are. Right. We're, we're, I, I, we're our eighth year and cruising right along. So, hey, I don't, I don't have That's to right. That's right. Eight years. Eight that's years. Right. Wow. You know, so, so, so far, you know, we've had our ups and downs. We've learned things. We've... Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, done new things, tossed out things, you know, it's a work in progress. Right. It's a work in progress until it's a household name, you know? Right. You know, I, I, I don't think people realize the massive undertaking one experiences trying to put a festival together, whether it's small or big. It is. It is. At whatever level you are, it's an all year round thing. You're planning, you're literally planning when you stop the last one. The last song that plays, Gary Chandler's playing something, everybody whoop, 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 whoop on a Sunday night. Right. Man, when that music goes off, we're already talking about, okay, what's the date of the next festival? Who do we want to book? You're running around. Some of those DJs just stop playing. We're right in your face again. Hey, what are you doing in 20? <laughs> <laughs> you know, nobody wants to hear, hey, can we, can we hold this price right there? Right, <laughs> you know, right, right. Because, <laughs> as you know, even the DJ games change as people get popular or they have a hot release or mm. – all of a sudden they're on the uh, the European circuit or whatever, then man, you can you can book a guy for five hundred dollars, it's five thousand next year. Right. And then fifty thousand right. a year after that. So right, right. You know, right. Right. we're not there yet. Right. <laughs> <laughs> We're not, we're not there yet. It's all good, man. I I, I truly appreciate uh, Shari Vari Festival. The 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 record Shari Vari was that any inspiration at all to? No, um, the Shari Vari record. There was a Shari Vari so high school social club mm-hmm. that was uh, created by a guy named um, Brian Bledsoe, and they were both. Most of the members were based out of Montford High School. Mm-hmm. Um, the Shari Vari record actually came a couple of years after they were already throwing parties. And that's why the Sharvari record has the S in it mm-hmm. as opposed to the C of the right. social club. Because if you talk to the guys that came out, the number of names that came out with the song, they didn't want any confusion of the brand at that time or think they were trying to poach on, even though there was some, <laughs> right, you right. Say there was a little bit of some fun. type of connection, right? Yeah, right, yeah. I mean, they, right. I don't think they wanted to say a direct connection, like, "Hey, we just came and stole your logo and your name," and all this kind of <laughs> stuff. you know. And that, and that obviously became an incredibly iconic song, mm. even though the high school days of the '80s are far gone. You still hear people dropping that song and remixes that song, and still talking about that song, right? You know, and that's right. part of that's part of history. That's why we need the history of it to, um, you know, cement that in. I think the, the type of project you guys are doing is going to do some incredible work in that area of how you guys mm-hmm. are following, you know, the guy getting the drum machines. You guys really went back and really connected the dots of, you know, where this huge industry has all came from, some of the early roots in Detroit and Chicago. Yeah, I, you know, I, I, I connect with this documentary and obviously there are plenty of them out there but there's always like this, this, this uh, passing, uh, 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 mentioning of Detroit's contribution to electronic music. You know, it's like a, a blurb, and then we're on to the next. And because they want to right. wash it away, you know. Right. You know, and, right. I, and I think the interesting thing about this history, Reggie, is we have a unique opportunity right now mm-hmm. with films like yourself that most of the people that actually created this history are still alive. Mm. And you don't get that all the time. You know, if I want to go write a history about blues or, or you know, folk or whatever like that, the majority of the true creators and the, and the pioneers of it are gone. Mm. But with House 
and techno. Now you can argue about all that Bellevue three stuff and who created techno. It doesn't matter because not only them, but mostly the other people that also say they were part of it also, that's an argument for historians or whatever, but almost everybody's still alive. Right. So you can still go get their story without saying, you know, which came first, the chicken or the egg. Go go interview all of them. Right. You know, you can right. interview all of them. The same thing with House. Most of the early Chicago guys who are connected to House and stuff, they're all, they're all floating around still doing gigs. Mm-hmm. So people in the DJ business, there's always a lot of, uh, of bragging and what I call uh, make believe about how long you've been doing this and, and how well, right. I've been doing this since 1967 when I was right. mixed. I'm like, so right. to me, what I like about this business is there's usually physical proof, whether it be a flyer or some type of sticker or something. The history is right there. Reggie Dose can trace the first time he did a party, holds up this flyer and says, oh, I remember when I was at the, uh, you know, the mm-hmm. Southfield Hilton and mm-hmm. I did a graduation party in 1986. You can right. hold it up and that's your proof. Right. So I don't, I hate when DJs are talking about, yeah, they've been mixing since this year. And I'm like, on oh, what mixer? Right, right. Because there was no mixer in the year you're talking about. Or they'll say about, oh, yeah, I had 1200s before 1200s even came out. Right, it, right. It's so funny <laughs> that there's such a definitive connection to all this stuff. Well, I was the, I was a resident at Cheeks in, in 19 such and such. I'm like, it was closed. Right. You know, or, or some club that was burnt down. Or, you know, there's enough of us, all of us collectively, there's enough of us out there to be like the living history to keep people honest. Mm. I can't just start saying how, oh, I was the first one to use a strobe light at a party or something. Somebody says, Wait, dude, what are you, I was at your first party. You didn't even have a strobe. You know, you know right. what I'm saying? I mean, I know I'm exaggerating, right, but right. I, I love hearing people have the conversations while there's still all these so-called old heads still around. Right. To say, no, I don't think that's how it happened. Right. You know, and that's right. not the party I remember. Right, you right. Met, you know, people love the, we all in this business love to exaggerate crowd size. You mm-hmm. know, you're, you're mm-hmm. talking about, like, you're, you're filming this from your home. I'm filming it from a room in my home. But, you know, I say, yeah, me and Reggie, we, were, we was on the call. I had like 60 people in the room listening to Reggie interview me. And you're like, 60 people? Dude, you're in a box like, you know, six feet by six feet. That's how they do parties. You know, they start right. talking about there was 800 people there. I'm like, uh, right. not at the club that holds 175 people. Right. So, I'll, so I'll give you a max of a packed party of 250. Okay, okay. Right. But I'm right. not going to 800 with you. Right. Nowhere near. Right. So I'll back up every friend of mine that wants to exaggerate a story a little bit <laughs> because it makes it, embellishment makes it funny or fun, but right. I'm not going with uh, pure fabrication. Right, right. You know right. that that I'm right. having to say no. I don't remember it that way, or you know. So man, let's 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 uh, end it on talking about this logo, man. It, is there any significance to the Sharivari logo? Any meaning? Behind uh, the, the Shavari logo eventually came from just obviously that being a music box speaker type of thing in the middle mm, uh, okay. to symbolize the m- music. And then the six arms all started with the six people that started the initial planning of the festival. Nice. There were six of us involved. When we first started the festival, it was myself and Steve Dunbar mm. basically putting together a crew to plan this festival. And he was to pick two people to come aboard and I was to pick two people so that you would have different people and different elements and different thought processes as opposed to just coming out of me and Steve's head. Teresa Hill is part of the original and still. Okay. Yep. Okay. 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 Cause we yeah, have a very pivotal part of, uh, you know, music, you know, DJ selection and, okay. and everything, okay. everything that we do, you know, okay. it really is a group that, um, you know, that group thought really controls the direction of almost everything we do. We, we vote on the stupidest and most minute things of a, uh, the color of a flyer or mm-hmm. what day it's going to be mailed out. You know, nobody's just out there willy nilly doing what they want. It's like before you do something, we, you know, we kind of just jump on a Zoom call or jump, even if it's just a text and say, hey, you know, I'm thinking about, I think about the color should be green this year. Everybody comes back with something. 
right. it's either agreement or no, I think it should be yellow or I think it should be purple, whatever. Like mm-hmm. I said, even the most minute details we kind of decide. So yeah. Steve, Steve uh, obviously played a major role in. Oh, in ma- major role. Okay. okay. Ma- major role. Steve wow. Dunbar was was the beginning. Hmm. You know. You know. He he he. Steve had a vision of what he wanted to do, and he called me, and I told him what my vision was, and some aspects were cobbled together, and and some aspects have obviously evolved because every year you're doing something different, mm-hmm. as well as all of the input of the group proper and over the years the group has changed mm, you know okay. there's, uh, there's there's people that have left and people that have been added and each thing it's like you know it's a, it's a gumble you know what i'm saying everybody's sprinkling their ingredient i like pepper and you like hot sauce and this guy's bringing okra and all of a sudden no you know you're you're still doing this you know it's a it's a dish that hasn't been served properly yet mm. it's a it's a work in progress for this incredible delicious meal that you think you're concocting, you know, and each, each year is another somebody, everybody tasting, oh, oh needs more salt, right. needs more whatever, you know, right. and, and that's where we're going. We're going for the, 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 the perfect party that you think that you, you, the perfect sound, you know, what is it, you know, you probably in all these years of playing have still not played your perfect gig yet <laughs> where you're going to come home and tell your family, man, that was the one. I killed it. I mean, I'm sure you've had a bunch of incredible performances, but DJs and most artists, as well as people like me, marketers and stuff like that, you are, it's like, you are always chasing the next big thing. And it's Mm -hmm. never good enough because as soon as you're done, there's something you saw you could tweak. Uh, You know, you're, you're a producer. I'm sure you've had songs come out and you listen to them months later. You say, "Ah, man, I should have, Right there, I said, put a little little drop right there, and then you'll fix right. it on the next one. Right. But you're never going to stop critiquing yourself. You're going to never stop improving yourself because anybody that does that is foolish, right. you know. Because this process of anything never stops, man. You know, right. you always have to take in new information from the outside. Um, technology changes. You know, uh, you know, customer wants and needs change. You know, so right. you have to continue to change, you know? Right. And that and that's what we're doing. We're, we're going for that evolvement to evolve into the festival we want to be that we don't know we want to be yet. Nice. And that and that's where we are. One of the key DJs you know, that, that we have to acknowledge was uh, Steve Dunbar. You know, Steve Dunbar was a person who was there from the beginning, working with Todd Johnson to develop the Sharavari Festival. But he also goes back to the scene that was built and that this entire uh, movement came from, the party club scene. He was a staple DJ alongside of, of, of many, many other DJs. Uh, yeah, he passed recently. We have to give him tribute, you know, and, and we're, you know, hey, we want to dedicate, um, you know, th- this part of the podcast to his memory because he was such a s- seminal and uh, noteworthy character that um, defined what Detroit techno was and uh, what it has become. So it's so important for us to make sure that we're capturing the legacy of these giants in the history of techno. It was great to hear from Todd who was there every step of the way as Sharivari Festival has been building its legacy in Detroit and expanding its community. His daughter, Carmen Johnson, has been brought into that community, and she's been a part of it ever since she was very young. Known as Silly Girl Carmen, let's hear from this upcoming DJ, artist, singer, actress and model from our producer Jennifer Washington. 
our own now. Dancing on my own now. Repeat after me, after me. Everybody get along now. Johnson, but as a performer, I go by Silly Girl Carmen. Um, I'm a DJ, model, actress, um, artist. I kind of do a little bit of everything in the creative entertainment world. Um, but yeah, primarily what my passion and focus is right now is being a DJ and working on music, putting and, and really highlighting, yeah, the culture within house music and other women. Because I also host my own radio show called Wonderful DJs. So yeah, just, just uh, expanding into the industry of music and being a DJ. And I'm originally from Detroit, Michigan. I've been all over the, the world a little bit as far as living in LA, Miami, New York, but um, I'm pretty much based back in Detroit now. And that's, that's what I love and I call it home. So it always feels good to be back. Tell me a little bit about uh, your influence growing up, um, your musical influence and how did that start? Yeah, um, well, definitely directly within my family, there's musical background and musicians in my family. So um, maybe not, because I started singing actually when I was younger, that's kind of what brought me into music was uh, being a vocalist and I still do that now. But I have people in my family who are trumpet players, bass players, piano players, and they've toured with people. So the music's always been there. I had an uncle, his, he goes by uh, Mark Johnson and he played with the, the brothers Johnson. He toured with them for some years as a, a pianist. So that's somebody you might know. My cousin also, Chris Johnson, he toured with Count Basie's orchestra. He's a trumpet player. So like a lot of people, you know, in, in the cut of, of good music, just doing their thing. Um, but yeah, those are the only two that maybe have done something a little more mainstream. And then of course, just directly from my dad in the Detroit music scene, I was always around good music and DJs and going to events and hearing house music and just, just stuff that I loved. And it was like very soulful house. That's what I loved about being, that's what made me fall in love with house music originally. It was just like the soul and the spirit of it, the energy that it brought out of people. So yeah, early on, I just remember being around a lot of good music and, and great DJs and musicians. Tell me more about the radio show you were talking about. Pretty much during the pandemic is when I launched the show. It's called Wonderful DJs. It's a radio show platform um, that's under and partnership with Sharvari Radio. Uh, they also launched their radio platform during the pandemic. And the concept started, uh, it really evolved from the start of the wonderful stage that we did at Sharavari in 2019 to highlight all females. So the wonderful stage was an all female stage through the whole uh, festival weekend and then yeah during the pandemic everybody of course was going to streaming and all you know podcast radio shows so we were like we're launching as well and I was excited to we're bring to life this all-female platform so we have wonderful radio um, it streams every Wednesday at 8 p.m eastern standard time and yeah it's every week I bring uh, on a new guest they do a 60 minute mix I sometimes will interview the guests. That'll also be a part of the episode. And it's just women from all over the world that do music, produce, you know, artists. And it's exciting because I've even expanded the conversation more recently to just highlight women in other industries such as fitness, environmentalism, fashion, business. So we're just talking to wonderful women anywhere that are excelling at their craft, but it definitely is primarily showcasing women in music. Um, so yeah, it's been it's been growing and I'm very passionate about it because I love connecting with other women around the world and like just expanding the conversation and network. So it's been growing really good. In all your travels and all that, how does um, Detroit shape, you know, kind of who you are and how you move about the world in, in your profession? Yeah, um, I, it didn't click in until later in life but I really feel so blessed to be from Detroit as I've been in other cities and just, you know, you see how people move, you see how people work with each other in business. And I'm just glad I have that home base that I can call Detroit because there's such a grounding and like a realness about how, you know, how we go about the world after being from Detroit and just being around the culture of Detroit. Um, so I just, I'm just for grateful sometimes yeah I don't I don't know if there's like a one word you could put to it but I just think it's it's a ground it's a groundedness a realness that comes with being from Detroit and um 
yeah, I think that that's the basis of it. I always, I know I always have that to rely on. Like, it feels like I have a home base. So even when I'm outside of, when I'm in other cities, just even the name, when you say you're from Detroit, it just travels, it has weight, it has presence. Like when you people find out you're from Detroit, it's like, you know, we have a strong network and a strong background of people in multiple industries. So it's just, it's I think it's just powerful, so. I, I enjoy it now more so later in life. Like, yeah, I'm from Detroit. This feels good. <laughs> How do people respond to you as it relates to the techno and being from Detroit? And do you have to explain to people that techno is from Detroit or what's been your experience? Um, no, honestly, I think whenever it comes up, people are definitely, they recognize right away, like, oh, Detroit, like that's historical in relation to techno, house music, electronic music. So. I think right away, you know, people have, they, they'll they have names of people that they can drop, you know, that are related to techno or an experience they had, you know, with music or just travel in general related to Detroit. I think, yeah, I, I don't think I've ever, in, in more recent years, everybody that I've networked with, they've been very uh, curious about Detroit or at least recognizing its history already in a good way. So... Yeah, and I yeah, in conversation, the only the only whenever I talk to somebody about Chicago, there's always that slight debate of like, okay, was you know we're kind we're kind of in the same boat, but there's still that half and half claim of like, was it Chicago? Was it Detroit? Like, who came first with the techno and you know the house music style? So, um, but no, I think I think the claim and the history and the stamp of its relationship with techno um, and the Detroit culture. I think it's, I think it's known, it's, it's got its presence, you know? And I do think as a musician and an artist, once I say Detroit, it's already like a little bit of like a boost of maybe like a stamp of approval or legitimacy, like, oh, you're from Detroit. Like it just comes with a good, you know, we have a good track record for what comes out of the city. So it's cool. Tell me how your dad's festival, Sharivari, is, how does it compare with the other festivals in Detroit or, you know, how is it different? What's your take on that? I think what makes it different is the way it started. It just, and it's grown. So that's really, um, it's evolved and it's something different now and it's in the coming year, but it really just started as such a homegrown, it had a family feel, a very community-based feel, and, and we started small in a sense. You know, we really just, the the Sharvari team just really picked up and said, we're gonna do this, we're gonna bring in the DJs we know, we're gonna, you know, bring great house music to the city. So it felt just like a family community thing. And it's just been a blessing to see it, ex, you know, expand and grow into something bigger. And we've been able to bring in different talent and bring different assets to it as far as yoga and art you know we're trying to expand and make it more of an experience for people um but yeah i think the main thing of just it, it feeling like a very connected community-based thing you know there's not some big like higher up business company side of it like the day of the festival the whole weekend everybody who's a part of it everybody who built it started it, it we're all right in there enjoying the experience with everybody so it's like it just feels good um and yeah i think i think the interest in bringing something great to the community that is grounded and representing uh detroit artists in particular you know like we that was really what built it started and what maintains it is the fact that we're representing and playing and getting to showcase detroit artists and djs um so yeah, I, I think that's that's just what makes it special. I was pretty impressed to see how uh, the festival was able to just kind of like navigate the rough waters of the, the pandemic last year. What is your um, take on that and how do you see, you know, new ways of doing things that could really, you know, continue in the future? Yeah, um, I really do have to give credit to my dad, Todd Johnson, and, and the team that he's had. Dan Pembroke is somebody new on our team that helped us do this whole tech side of being able to stream. Like everybody on the Sharvari team was so fast to, uh, you know, make that pivot and that turn to be like, okay, well, 
everything has changed. We're not going to be able to connect with people in person. And we were like very fast to jump on the platforms and create experiences and streamed events that people could tune into. And I think that really was a um, just a very strong moment. Honestly, it seemed like a weird time and it seemed like for a lot of people, it would be a downfall and like a hindrance. But I think with that fast pivot, we were able to almost expand even broader and stronger because it was on World Wide Web. It wasn't just whoever could show up to Detroit. Um, so yeah, just the connection and network of the brand name and the showcasing of still Detroit talent on a broader scale, it was, you know, it, it, it had a lot of growth even in that time. Um, cause yeah, they were doing a lot of streamed, uh, streamed events, uh, video, you know, video streaming with DJs via mixed cloud. So it was, it was reaching even a wider audience. So it was like a really pivotal growth moment even still. And I think it just it laid the groundwork for the possibilities of so much like this whole streaming idea. And as we expanded and learned like what you can really do and how you can broadcast and how you can edit and bring different elements that keep people excited. It just, I think it will just continue, you know, to be a part of the brand still, you know, and, and of course they have the radio platform now. So it's like, there's just, it's just another component of the brand. And I think it's just, it's really strong. and. Uh, yeah, they moved right on time because I think it was hard. It was hard for people, you know, especially in certain industries to be like, well, how do we still maintain our name? How do we still present to the people? How do you work all these, you know, the technology side of it? So it, it came together in a divine way for the brand to still keep, you know, going. So do you think that the whole streaming of performances is going to continue to grow too? as a DJ, you know, and as for the festival? I do think so. I think, yeah, I think it will always just be a component um, that can still be utilized in so many ways because it opened the, our eyes to the fact that, wow, this is actually really powerful because say somebody in London, somebody in New Zealand, that's not gonna be able to come to Detroit when we have our festival, this is a perfect way to still, to be present with them, to share our brand, share the experience. So I think regardless of what happens, you know, um, in our society, I think it's always going to be, yeah, a, a great tool to use to continue to expand. Tell me when the fest festival is and kind of what you look forward to um, with this year's festival. Yeah, so the festival is actually going to kick off August 12th. They've actually added a an extra surprise day to the festival, but the, the main days were always thir the 13th, 14th, and 15th of August. Uh, but there will be a, a special guest on that Friday, the 12th. Um, yeah, I'm super excited because it's there in a new location this year. We're going to be at the historical Fort Wayne in Detroit. So that whole ambiance and that location is just like already impressive and really going to be cool. I think when we get to see it fully set up. Um, yeah, so I'm kind of just I'm, I'm excited to see how everybody experiences and enjoys the new location. And because obviously we had to skip last year, I'm just excited to see faces again, see who shows up, who I remember from last year, enjoy the music, you know, all in a big experience with other people. So it's I think it's going to feel really good. And um, yeah, it's, it's something different because we're in a, we're in a new spot. And I think yeah, for Detroit, we will be the first festival of the, you know, the year, the season. Okay, so that's, yeah, that's right. That's pretty powerful, too. So I hope everybody is excited and just ready to get back out. The Detroit Techno 101 course is providing opportunities for young people in schools and music aficionados to explore the factors that went into creating Detroit techno. So be sure to go to musicorigins.org, click on education, and you can take a look at these courses and learn a little bit more about the factors that created techno in Detroit. Well, guys, 
We really hope you enjoyed our ninth episode of God Said Give Them Drum Machines behind the scenes podcast. Please make sure you follow us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you stream your podcasts. Tune in to Sharivari Festival. Make sure you check them out online. We appreciate you all supporting our independent filmmaking journey. Shout out to the Universal Rhythm Corporation in Portland, Dwayne Washington in Georgia. And, you know, don't forget to head over to our store and uh, get you some merch because we still have an ongoing 20% off sale. And you can get that at gsgedm.com forward slash shop. S-H-O-P. Also, guys, check out musicorigins.org to learn more about the Detroit Techno 101 course, which is helping Detroit Techno enthusiasts and students around the world to learn about the history of techno and its birthplace in Detroit. Shout out to the EPM music team, Oliver, Addy, Jonas, Shout out to Output for supplying me with those wonderful sounds that I'm using to compose uh, music for this great documentary. And big thanks to Fusicology, Asia, and Amy. We appreciate you both. Stay updated with us on Facebook and Instagram at God Said Give Them Drum Machines. We can't wait to share with you this film, guys. We just really appreciate and thank you so much for joining us on this journey. God said, give them drum machines behind the scenes podcast. This is going to be our final episode of the season, guys. It has been a wonderful journey digging into the histories and anecdotes behind the story of Detroit Techno. We will continue bringing you Detroit stories. So we ask that you please keep sharing yours with us, guys. Thank you so much. We appreciate the love. It's all about Detroit Techno. We'll see you soon. Much love. Peace.